welcome to another episode of Other Items of Interest. I'm your host, Jack Sablocki. This week, unfortunately, I am sick, and I am getting sick throughout the episode. So, it's not the most fun thing to listen to. It's very low energy, but we do prevail. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Other Items of Interest. I'm your host, Jack Sablocki. What do we got for you this week? Well, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well, each and every one of you. I've been kind of busy working on uh, a couple of bonus pods for the show, probably for release around Thanksgiving and uh, week of Christmas, whenever that is. Um, I doubt anybody listens to podcasts, so I'm just going to put up a couple of bonus pods one of which is all about um, poops and farts because we're highbrow like that. Um, we just we have so many stories in the news about uh, pooping and farting that it was a no-brainer just to gather all those stories together and put them into a bonus podcast. Uh, the other one is um, more along the lines of uh, strangeness from the skies ufology uh, we have quite a few UFO stories as well not as many as the poop stories so the second uh, bonus podcast will be all about ufology um, I don't know which one can be released first um, probably the poop and fart one for Thanksgiving for that week yeah so it's it's sort of exciting. Uh, I'm just I'm a little bit a buzz about it. Um, speaking of ufology, it's um, been in the news recently. Uh, re- remember those uh, UFO videos that got released uh, a few months ago, and they're really kind of strange and good quality. They're good quality because they were coming from cameras on uh, Air Force jets, one of them were military videos of uh, unknown aerial objects, the Navy came out and said, yeah, those weren't supposed to be released, are bad, can you just forget about those? Um, I don't think anybody's going to forget about them if people are still talking about them. Um, I think they should just... I'm sure what people are saying now, I'm saying it is, why not just release whatever else you have? Obviously, these uh, few videos that were released didn't cause a panic or a stir. So, why not release more? Put all your cards on the table. Show us the dead bodies. Yeah? But they probably will not do that. Um, So, today's show is... um, a little different, a little weird. I'm feeling a little weird today. I'm not. I'm not up to my uh, usual game. I feel like I'm mumbling a lot. My energy is really low. I don't know why that is. Anyway, today's show is uh, a little different, a little strange. Um, first part of the show, while I was assembling news for the show this week, I noticed United Press International. A good number of their stories were just um, world record stories and Guinness world record stories. So I was able to collect about 10 of those, so we're going to do those right up front uh, in a somewhat quick succession because they're not the most entertaining stories I know. But there's very little news this week that I was able to collect, so this is how we're doing it. Once these stories are done... We'll get into the um, the more interesting stuff, but I do I do have it formatted in a way. The first few world record stories are about food because those are usually the most boring, and they'll get more interesting on from there. Hopefully, we'll see. So, with all that out of the way, uh, I think we should get on with the show, shall we? Yes, we shall. Oh, 
Okay, here we go. I do have to apologize right up front. I do believe I am getting a cold, and that's why my energy is so low. I I feel like I'm dragging my ass through this podcast, uh, and it's not really what I want to be doing right now. Uh, with that said, to warn you that you're getting a shitty show, uh, let's get on with it from... All these articles, the next 10 articles, are from UPI, United Press International. Um, Excuse me while I click around in the background there. First up, world's largest artichoke salad assembled in Peru. You like artichokes? I love them. The university in Peru set a Guinness World Record when it assembled an artichoke salad weighing 1,729.59 pounds. San Ignacio de Loyola, Loyola, excuse me, <laughs> university gathered 200 volunteers in the Plaza de Armas de Trujillo to assemble the artichoke salad on a tray measuring 16 feet long and 5 feet wide. Guinness World Records confirmed the 1,729.59 pound result was a new record for the world's largest artichoke salad. The salad was divvied up into portions after the weighing and distributed to members of the public who attended the record attempt. Organizers said the goal of the event was to promote artichoke consumption in Peru. Now, we go over to Japan. Japanese festival cooks up world's largest serving of fried chicken. And there is a picture of the, uh, it's kind of a, a big box they made to hold all the fried chicken. It's a lot of fried chicken. Uh, a Guinness World Record was broken at a food festival in Japan when 18 vendors participated in cooking up the world's largest serving of fried chicken. The Karagi Festival in Nakatsu Oida Prefecture featured 18 restaurants specializing in Karagi, Japanese fried chicken, cooking up a total 3,675 pounds of fried chicken Sunday to break the Guinness record. And I don't know if I'm saying Karagi right or not. I don't know what I'm saying today. I think this is the second show where you can listen to me actually get sick throughout the the uh, throughout the episode, because this is where I'm. This is where I'm heading. Is sickness. Let's get back to the uh, article. Enough about me. A Guinness representative was on hand to confirm the final amount bear the previous record, three thousand three hundred seventy-three pounds, which was set by a chicken processing firm in Tatori Prefecture in 2017. The chicken was served to attendees at the festival, which concludes Monday. All right. Now on to Germany. Record-breaking 2,663-pound schnitzel cooked up at German festival. And there is a picture right up top of a giant schnitzel. It's huge. Uh, A festival in Germany broke a Guinness World Record by cooking up a 2,663-pound schnitzel measuring 753.5 square feet. I think I'm starting to lose my voice. This is not good. The schnitzel... Oh, my God, my voice is completely going. Let me get a sip of coffee, please. The Schnitzel Festival, Schnitzel Fest, excuse me, event in the town of Menkofen, Bavaria, featured 400 pork chops, 4,000 eggs, and 551 pounds of breadcrumbs being turned into a giant schnitzel, a battered and fried pork dish. Festival organizers said it took nearly 3,700 gallons of oil to fry the massive meat. A Guinness World Records adjudicator was on hand to verify the schnitzel's measurements and certify that it broke the previous record of 1,212.5 pounds. 
The schnitzel was officially certified as the world's largest before being split into 4,800 portions and sold to attendees at the festival. Organizers said proceeds from the sale of the record-breaking dish will be donated to charity. Well, that's good. That's nice. Schnitzel money going to charity. Next, we have... 2,344 drink cans opened simultaneously for a Guinness record. A Guinness World Record was broken at an Ohio stadium when 2,344 people opened canned beverages at the same time. The Shelby County students, teachers, and community members gathered Wednesday morning at Sydney Memorial Stadium to open their beverages at the same time and break the Guinness record for most people opening a drink can simultaneously. Guinness officials were on hand to confirm the attempt. Organized as part of Shelby County's bicentennial celebrations, beat the previous record of 1,204 people opening drink cans simultaneously, which was set in Japan in 2018. Officials said they chose the can opening record to celebrate Shelby County's history as the home of stole machinery, Sydney factory where the process for mass producing pop top cans was invented and developed. Now that's interesting. I did not know that. Now we have moving away from food into the more uh, silly, silly ones, silly record breakers. Uh, a group builds 2,044 sand castles to break Guinness record. A Welsh community, I hope there's no Welsh words in this, I can't handle it today. A Welsh community group gathered hundreds of volunteers on a beach to break a Guinness world record by building 2,044 sandcastles. The beautiful Barry community group, which organized the record attempt to celebrate reaching 5,000 members on Facebook, said 2,044 sandcastles were built by hundreds of men, women, and children on the Whitmore Bay Beach. The group said the sandcastles had to be built in continuous lines end-to-end -end with at least four towers per castle to qualify for the record. Organizers said an official surveyor was on hand to verify that the group surpassed the previous record of 1,924 sandcastles. The surveyor's report and other evidence from the event is being submitted to Guinness for official recognition. All right. Now we have Freediver breaks underwater walking record at 267 feet, 8.6 inches. Oh, uh, and there's a name in this article I cannot pronounce without having a stroke. I will either suffer a stroke or an aneurysm. My brain just might melt, but it's a name that I cannot get. I'll try it for your entertainment, but it's not going to happen. A Turkish freediver broke a Guinness World Record for the longest underwater walk with one breath when she went underwater and strolled for 267 feet, 8.6 inches. Now here's the name. Okay, the first name is hard enough. Bilja? Bilga? Bilga, maybe? I don't know. Last name, Kling Ig Ire. Kling Ig Ire. That's the best I can pronounce it. I heard something snap in my jaw as I tried to say it. Anyway, she broke the record in the female category and even surpassed the male category record holder whose walk went on for... 267 feet, 3.24 inches. Uh, she previously held the record in 2017 when she walked 220 feet, 4.08 inches underwater, but her accomplishment was surpassed later the same year by Russian athlete Marina Kazankova. The athlete's latest attempt was performed in front of a cheering crowd at the... I, I don't even know how to say that. Aga Oglu? Aga Oglu? My World Club Swimming Pool in Istanbul. Those are not fun words or names to say. Now we go to Indiana. Indiana students' paper mache sculpture 
surpasses Guinness record. And there's a picture of the sculpture, but I'm not really sure what it's supposed to be. Check it out in the show notes at www.otheritemsofinterest.com. Uh, an Indiana University club created a 14-foot tall paper mache sculpture that is being submitted to Guinness World Records for recognition as the world's tallest. The Indiana University South Bend Fine Arts Club said its 14-foot tall sculpture made from old Martin's Supermarket's comment cards and 60 gallons of wheat paste is over a foot taller than the current Guinness World Record holder. Martin supplied the cards to the club and asked for them to be turned into a work of art. When we brought it to the club, we told them either way, it's going to happen. It's too good of an opportunity for our community. We have to make this happen some way. Everyone in the club was about it. We all voted. It was unanimous. We were going to do it. Colton Sizer, president of the Fine Arts Club, told WBND-TV. Sizer said paperwork and other evidence is being submitted to Guinness to have the artwork recognized as the world's tallest paper mache sculpture. Honestly, it doesn't look that tall. Or maybe it's hard to tell with the picture. But it seems like somebody can beat this easily. This is the one to beat. If you just want a moment of glory. Now we move on to Michigan. Michigan Company's 690-pound lint ball sets Guinness record. We're now into the realm of balls of lint. Giant balls of lint. Guinness World Records said a Michigan company's bid to set a new world record was successful when it amassed a ball of lint weighing in at 690 pounds. Dryer Vent Wizard of Farmington Hills said it started collecting lint from its locations across the country earlier in the year with an aim toward assembling the world's largest lint ball and then lighting it on fire. Well, that's fun. The company predicted the ball would weigh near 1,000 pounds, easily meeting the Guinness goal of 99 pounds, and the final product was officially weighed at 690 pounds. It's not that close to 1,000 pounds, come on. The ball was ignited after the official weigh-in, and the flames were extinguished by the local fire department. Seems like they have an unfair advantage, being, you know, that they work with dryer lint day in and day out. It's pretty easy for them to collect. But whatever. It's a lot of lint. Uh, next we have Farm takes aim at Goat Yoga World Record with 500 expected in class. And Goat Yoga is the practice of doing yoga while goats climb on top of you. A Florida farm said it expects more than 500 people to participate in its attempt to break a Guinness World Record for the world's largest goat yoga session. Debbie Canton, 56, who owns Grady Goat Farm in Thanotasasa, Hillsborough County. I have no idea if I pronounced that one right. Thanotasasa. Thanotasasa? I'm just going to keep saying it until I, until, until I faint. So yeah, Debbie Canton, who owns the Grady Goat Farm in Thano Tosasa, Hillsborough County, with her husband, Rob, said more than 500 people and 110 goats are expected to participate in the world record attempt. The current record stands at 351 people and 84 goats, set in February at a goat yoga class in Arizona, and Man Farms in Abbotsford, British Columbia, unofficially broke the record in June with more than 400 people participating. We are going to smash the record, Canton told the Tampa Bay Times. Canton said reservations for the event are full, but interested participants can be added to a waiting list in case space opens up in time for Saturday's attempt. Uh, the record attempt is a fundraiser for Global Offensive Against Trafficking, or Project GOAT, project that opposes human trafficking and sexual exploitation of children. The project is part of the Grady Goat Foundation, a charity founded by the Cantons. It's nice when some of these um, these attempts at 
world records um, give to charity and not just, you know, not just for the fortune and glory. And finally, before my voice completely gives out, we head over to China. Water slide down Chinese mountain declared world's longest. A water slide that took two years to build on the side of a Chinese mountain has been declared the world's longest at 8,933 feet, 11 inches. Guinness said the water slide on the side of Puwasi Mountain in Lishu, China is over a mile and a half long and has been certified as the world's longest mountain hill slide water slide. It took about two years to construct the slide, which takes riders up to speeds of nearly 20 miles per hour. That doesn't sound safe. Uh, the water slide takes riders for a mountain rafting adventure as well, bringing the attraction's total time up to about an hour for the whole experience. Well, it might not be safe, but it sounds like fun. After returning to the homeland, how to develop it into a good way is always on my mind. At first, we just want to be the best in China. Then we realized this could be a Guinness World Records title to attract the world, said Lin Wenbi, general manager of Puwa Travel Development, the firm behind the water slide. So there we go. Those are your major contributions to the world. Interesting, perhaps. Amazing, could be. Um, I got nothing else. It was, it was, it was pretty mediocre, if you ask me. Uh, somewhat slightly amusing, a little bit impressive. I don't know. I'm going to go take a nap before the next story. A couple of months ago, we did a story about a, a man who, from England, who took part in a marathon uh, in the Yukon, in the frozen tundra. Um, he didn't make it. I mean, he lived, <laughs> but he didn't make it. He didn't. He didn't get through the whole marathon. In fact, he wound up getting frostbite on his toes, and he lost a couple of toes. With one of those toes, he. Um, donated it to a Yukon hotel who have a very special cocktail. And uh, at the time, he couldn't get from England to visit the hotel again just because he was still in the hospital and I guess probably learning to walk on feet without toes. Uh, but here we have an update from the New York Post. Man to drink iconic shot with his own severed toe in it. I feel like everything I just explained made no sense whatsoever. Did it make sense? Does it matter? Is anybody even listening to this? I'm just going to get on with the story. When Nick Griffiths lost his big toe to frostbite in February last year, he gave it a second life as a morbid cocktail. This June, the British man donated his detached digit to a bar in Canada, which has a decades-long tradition of serving a whiskey shot garnished with a dehydrated human toe. It's mummified. Next week, Griffiths will reunite with his severed appendage, taking the inaugural sip of his very own toe tipple. The legendary $5 drink called the Sour Toe Cocktail has been served at the Yukon's downtown hotel since 1973. Drinkers must touch <laughs> drinkers must touch their lips to the toe to earn a certificate of completion. To date, more than 90,000 have. And I think when we did the original story, I said if I took this challenge as soon as that as soon as that toe hit my lips or my tongue or my teeth, I would puke everywhere. It just sounds so gross. Uh, the titular toe of the sour toe is so sought after that it frequently gets stolen. 
hence the bar's need for Griffith's toe. He saw a toe wanted poster from the hotel shortly after losing his own to frostbite during the Yukon Arctic Ultramarathon and mailed in a specimen. I believe in the original article, I think a nurse told him about about the drink. I can't remember. But I don't think he saw a toe wanted poster from the hotel. I'm not saying they made this up, but be wary. We have been without a big toe for some time, so his generous tonation, like donation, but toe nation, you see what they did there? Brilliant. Will help ensure the tradition continues, says the hotel's general manager, Adam Jurel, in a statement. Also over the moon about the fresh toe is Terry Toemaster Lee, who is in charge of preserving the toes used in the drink. He quickly got to work on Griffith's digit to make it garnish ready. It takes six weeks to mummify a new toe on rock salt before it's ready to serve, Lee says. It is now ready, but he wants Griffith to take the inaugural shot. We've been waiting for Nick to be the first to do a shot with the new toe and make it extra special, Lee says, adding, Nick's big toe is a beauty. The reunion will be a happy one for Griffiths. I'm excited to be returning to the Yukon and reuniting with my detached digit, Griffiths said. The tourist board of the Canadian Territory has footed the bill for Griffiths. <laughs> footed the bill. Because he's missing toes on his foot. Uh, footed the bill for Griffiths' flight from Manchester, England, for the sake of his toe ceremony, which will take place at the downtown hotel on Monday. Doing the Saratoga cocktail with my own big toe will be a memory I will take to the grave, Griffith says. Interesting. Kind of a feel-good story. You know, he loses his toe, but his toe is on in infamy. Lots of people drinking Saratoga cocktail with his, his lost digit. Not a bad way to lose a toe. feel like being outraged? Well, I got one for you. I got something to make you feel outraged. School puts desk of student with special needs in bathroom. It's as bad as it sounds. A middle school boy with special needs is furious that his desk was moved to the bathroom. It wasn't a prank. It was the school's doing. Danielle Goodwin said her son Lucas has autism and an autoimmune disorder, so he does best in a quiet place. Goodwin said she talked it over with the teacher and then brought the 11-year-old to Whatcom Middle School on Monday. His teacher's solution was the solitude of the bathroom, and the boy's desk was over a toilet. Sad, stressed, embarrassed, said Lucas. I was like, how is this happening? How am I in the bathroom? Why? Goodwin said the teacher also gave him a camping mat to nap on the bathroom floor. Jesus Christ. I was stunned, she said. I was so shocked, I just took the picture because I didn't believe what I was seeing. When they found the desk in the bathroom, Mom asked if there was another option. She said the teacher said no. It's not an appropriate place for anyone but especially for Lucas with his PANDAS condition. PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. So you know. And he can't be around germs, Goodwin said. It smelled, and just the thought of my son working his school day away in a bathroom was disturbing to me. She immediately took Lucas home and said he doesn't want to go back to Watcom Middle School. Oh yeah, we'll just put him in the bathroom, perfect space. That's not okay, you can't do that, said Lucas Goodwin. Spokeswoman for the Bellingham Public Schools said space has been an issue at the school. <laughs> That's no excuse. I can tell you that we are aware of the situation 
and that we have taken immediate steps to remove the desk depicted in the photo and ensure that the space is not used as a learning space, the representative said, like a true representative. We received a complaint and we are continuing to investigate. That's pretty... Uh, the only term that comes to mind, the only phrase I can think of is, that's pretty fucked up. I'm getting my cursing in early in this episode, but um, that's that's very wrong. Putting a kid with special needs in the bathroom and expecting to learn. No. No. Just no. And if you thought the previous story was bad, here's another one. From WFLA.com News Channel 8 on your side. Florida grandmother outraged after six-year-old arrested for tantrum. That's a little rough. I don't think I've, I've ever come across a six-year-old that deserved to be arrested. A Florida grandmother was shocked to find out her six-year-old granddaughter had been arrested Thursday for throwing a tantrum. Marilyn Kirkland said Kaya's journey to the juvenile detention center by Orlando police officers began at Lucius and Emma Nixon Elementary Charter School. What do you mean she was arrested? He said, there was an incident and she kicked somebody and she is being charged and she is on her way, Kirkland explained. The disorienting chaos was too much for Kirkland to process. She has a medical condition that we are working on getting resolved and he says, what medical condition? She has a sleep disorder, sleep apnea. And he says, well, I have sleep apnea, and I don't behave like that. My goodness. Uh, First grader Kaya was handcuffed and carted off where Kirkland says she was fingerprinted and even had a mug shot taken. They told us we had to wait a few minutes because Kaya was being fingerprinted, and when she said fingerprinted, it hit me like a ton of bricks. No six-year-old child should be able to tell somebody that they had handcuffs on them and they were riding in the back of a police car and taken to a juvenile center to be fingerprinted, mugshot. And now Kaya is happy to be back home. Possible, possible litigation in this one, probably. I think there is an update that I, I don't have here. Um, I want to say this officer was demoted for arresting a six-year-old. Maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, imagining that, but I I think that's what happened. He was demoted, and rightly so. Should have been fired. I mean, how do you you go about your job as a cop, seeing all sorts of shit, and you still have the gall to arrest a six-year-old? For what? Doing six-year-old shit? Man, I I don't like these stories about kids. I don't know why I cover them. I had the choice to not cover them, but two in a row where kids are being shit on. It's not fun. I don't know about you, but I hate weddings. I hate going to weddings. Um, I don't know if I'd blow up my own house to get out of one, but from... Mazekmedia.com Pennsylvania man blows up own house on daughter's wedding day, killing himself. I don't think I'd go through that extent to skip a wedding. A Pennsylvania man blew up his suburban Pittsburgh home on the day of his daughter's wedding in what authorities said was suicide. Neighbors said they spotted the homeowner standing in front of his house in Edgewood shortly before an explosion that ignited a fire and eventually destroyed the house. Authorities said the homeowner's body was found amid the rubble at 318 Garland Street late Saturday night. His identity has not been released. The whole house was on fire, neighbor Rochelle Levine Levine, excuse me, told WTAE. The whole house was one big flame. It just exploded within a couple of minutes. The house just collapsed in one large movement with a lot of sound to it, neighbor Dan Loudermilk, 35, told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. By that time, it was fully in flames. It went up in flames remarkably fast. 
I thought it would take longer to burn, but it was like a minute and a half. It was crazy. Authorities said suicide notes were found in the homeowner's vehicle. The homeowner's neighbor, Nicole Antolovich, told WTAE that the explosion happened on the wedding day of the man's daughter. I've known them my whole life, Antolovich told the news station. Their daughter was getting married today, and they were supposed to be at a wedding. And that house is just, there's a picture of uh, firefighters working, and that house is just leveled. Police Chief Robert Payne said the department is investigating the explosion as a suspicious incident. It looks like he disconnected the gas line in the basement of the house, and of course it wouldn't take much of a spark to explode the house, Payne told the news outlet. And that's it. It's one way to go. He doesn't have to take the house with him, though. You know, a true friend will bury you in the backyard, if you ask. From Boston.com, an 83-year-old Maine woman buried her friend's body in the backyard. She says it was the woman's dying wish. While this is a morbid article, uh, it's kind of sweet, too. An 83-year-old woman says she has no regrets about burying the body of her friend in her Maine backyard a year and a half ago, an action she says was her friend's dying wish. Maine state troopers recovered the body, believed to be a woman in her 80s, on Wednesday at 239 Harrison Road in Norway. Police said the woman likely died in the last 12 to 18 months, and investigators are working to determine her cause of death. The homeowner, Vernell Jackson, told WMTW she has explained to investigators that her friend was living with her and asked to be buried in the backyard. She begged me, and I have witness to this, Jackson told the station. She asked me not to let her down. The 83-year-old reportedly buried her friend next to a well over the course of two days, explaining that because she has COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the task took her some time. I put her in a tarp, she told WMTW. I didn't carry her. I dragged her out there. Jackson told the station she didn't know she needed a permit to bury her friend and isn't sure if she's in trouble with police. She begged with me when she passed away that she didn't have enough insurance to bury her, and I don't have it. And she said, will you promise me to bury me in your yard so I'll be close? She considered me as a daughter she never had, she said. You're the daughter I never had. I want to be close to you, and I finally agreed to do it to satisfy her told the Sun Journal she is cooperating with authorities and that her friend died of natural causes. The friends met in church while they were both living in the South more than 20 years ago, and her friend moved into her main home four years ago. According to the Sun Journal, the friend became seriously ill and bedridden and was under the care of a doctor and hospice care in the months before she died. Jackson told the newspaper police came to her home on Tuesday for a well-being check on her friend. It's been like a year and a half, and they're finally doing a well-being check? Jesus. I stand behind what I did, Jackson told the Sun Journal. If I had known I needed a permit, I would have got a permit. Hmm. Well, good friend. Pay the permit next time. There's a lot going on in this headline from KSLA News 12, KSLA.com. Woman bites camel to escape enclosure at Louisiana truck stop. Owner says camel is friendly. There's a picture of a camel. If you're if you want to see a picture of a camel like you haven't seen one before, visit the show notes. Uh, A woman was sent to the hospital after biting the private area of a camel that was sitting on her at the truck stop in Gros Tite, Louisiana, according to the Iberville Parish Sheriff's Office. This is just one of those articles. Uh, On Thursday evening, a couple at the I-10 truck stop in Gros Tite was chasing after their deaf dog ran away from them, Sheriff Brett Stassi said. The dog, according to Stassi, ran under the double barbed wire fencing that fenced off the enclosure of the camel. The couple chased after the dog into the enclosure, meeting an agitated camel who was named Casper. Sheriff Stassi said somehow the 
camel sat on the woman. The woman, possibly out of self-defense, bit the camel's testicles. That's got to be some dank shit. That smell and that taste. Pamela Bossier, a manager of the Tiger truck stop, said the couple broke into the enclosure, causing the camel to panic. It was just crazy, Bossier told the Washington Post on Monday, to the point of why would somebody do that? She claimed the couple was throwing dog treats into the camel's pen before the dog ran in. She said the camel is friendly and plays with goats all the time. She claims he was playing around with the dog. I don't know camels could be friendly with other animals. They seem like jerks, camels. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think they'd be fun or friendly. But they say this camel's friendly, so what do I know? Uh, the woman was sent to the hospital, according to the sheriff. The extent of her injuries was not released. Bossier said the veterinarian is coming to check on the camel. Casper has been in the enclosure since last summer, replacing truck stop's previous attraction, Tony the Tiger. They had a tiger. That's a big step down. You go from tiger to camel, that's a good couple of steps down in the animal kingdom. Uh, the tiger had been put down in October 2017 because of kidney failure and other health issues, like living at a Louisiana truck stop. Uh, the tiger truck stop has stirred some controversy in the past after an animal rights group filed a petition to free Tony. Well, you tried, didn't you? I certainly hope you enjoy uh, innuendo and puns because this article has a few of them. From canoe.com, even in the headline, Huge blow. Firefighters dodge projectiles after massive semen explosion at bull insemination plant. Okay. Some Aussie firefighters were wary about taking it in the face while battling a raging fire at a bull artificial insemination plant on Tuesday. Yes, you heard it correctly. Wary about taking it in the face. According to ABC News Australia, 10 firefighting crews rose to the occasion. Oh my God. I, I don't know how many innuendos are in this article, but it's already too many. Rose to the occasion to battle a massive blaze at Yarram Herd Services in Gippsland, Victoria, Australia, early Tuesday morning. And there's a tweet of the aftermath of the blaze, and that place is just wrecked. Upon arrival, authorities found out that the fire had completely shredded the building, with County Fire Authority Gippsland Commander Chris Loshenkel telling the crew to be mindful of projectiles flying at them while battling the blaze. Apparently, the fire stimulated cylinders stimulated. The fire stimulated cylinders that contained bull semen, causing them to rapidly grow. As the fire raged on, the containers reached their climax points. That's when Loshenkal said, essentially the lids of the cryogenic cylinders were just popping off the top and projectiles were being thrown from the building, as told to ABC News Australia. So firefighters went into a defensive mode, initially to protect themselves, because there were also LPG cylinders at the neighboring property, and they did a magnificent job. About 100 cryogenic cylinders of cattle semen were destroyed in the fire, which has a huge blow to farmers, said Aaron Thomas, vice chairman of the Yarram Herd Services Committee. Thomas said the cylinders were worth between $453 and $906, while the semen varies in price between 4.53 to 86.13 per straw, Daily Mail Australia reported. Well, I guess they just have to get back to work collecting semen. The following article comes from foxnews.com. And as I always say with a Fox News article, 
if you visit the link in the show notes, do not wade into the comments section. It is a toxic waste dump. That being said, headline reads, Pair of underwear belonging to Ava Braun sell at auction for more than $4,600. A pair of underpants that belong to Ava Braun, the wife of Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, that Ava Braun, has been sold by a British auction house for more than $4,600. The BBC, I wonder who, who, who buys that shit. That's ridiculous. Uh, the BBC reported that an anonymous phone bidder purchased the pink silk underwear which bears bronze initials and was auctioned off by Humbert and Ellis auctioneers in uh, some town I can't pronounce in England for £3,700 or $4,614 U.S. American. Other items sold from what the auction house described as significant private European World War II collection included a gold bracelet bearing a swastika that was given to the wife of Luftwaffe commander Hermann Goering and bronze stained nightgown. The BBC report reported that the same bidder who bought bronze underwear purchased the nightgown. Okay. I'm really curious about who buys the shit. I mean, he's getting like he's buying a whole outfit from the underwear up. Underwear nightgown socks what's next uh, and there's there's a picture of the uh, undies on a tweet from Fox 40 News they look like granny panties to be honest did they have sexy underwear back then I don't know I'm asking anyway Braun was Hitler's companion for more than 12 years couple wed approximately 40 hours before they committed suicide in Hitler's Berlin bunker on April 30th, 1945, as Soviet forces were about to reach the Reich Chancellery. That's not a fun honeymoon, I don't think, but one that was well-deserved. I, I don't like Hitler. I don't think it needs to be said. I, I don't think, uh, I think a lot of people don't like Hitler. I know that's a crazy, crazy take on the on the subject matter, but fuck him. Uh, there continues to be a perennial interest in personal artifacts from such notorious high-level World War II figures, and accordingly such items, even without provenance, command high prices, auctioneer Jonathan Humbert said, according to the BBC. I wonder if he said that in his auctioneer voice, speaking real fast. At a similar auction in November 2016, a pair of lilac knickers worn by Braun was sold at the Philip Sorrell auction house for roughly $3,194, according to the New York Post. British law does not forbid the sale of Nazi memorabilia, but most major auction houses and online shopping sites prohibit it. Supporters of bans on Nazi memorabilia sales say the market for items from the Third Reich helps to fund far-right extremist groups. There is a real danger that this market funds far-right and extreme, extremist individuals who sell and trade this content, and that's the last thing we want, Joe Mulhall, a senior researcher at Hope Not Hate, told the BBC in April of last year. And that's it. And there are the fucking comments. I mean... By the second comment, it's a comment about Joe Biden, who has nothing, nothing to do with this article. I don't even like Joe Biden, so I'm not sticking up for him. It's just that the comment section on this Fox News is just complete shit. It's unbelievable. Uh, Michael Jackson joke, ha ha ha. Another one. This one mentions Bill Clinton and Joe Biden in the same, same sentence. I can't look at it anymore. It's hurting me physically. And here we are at the end of the show. The last story for the week. This one comes from WKBN.com. Trumbull County Sheriff's deputies pull over Amish buggy with stereo system. I guess I guess they're revolting, the Amish. 
started listening to stereo systems. Deputies said they pulled over an Amish buggy complete with alcohol and a stereo system early Sunday morning. Just before 1 a.m., Trumbull County Sheriff's deputies said they saw two Amish men drinking alcohol while riding on the back of a horse and buggy. The deputy said there was a 12-pack of Michelob Ultra on top of the buggy. They pulled the buggy over at Donley and Mahan Parker Roads in North Bloomfield, Ohio. Deputies said the people riding in it ran out into the trees while the horse continued down the road. <laughs> horse doesn't know when to stop. Can't look behind him. Where'd my people go? Uh, there were several open bottles of alcohol in the buggy, as well as a radio sound system, deputies said. The buggy was towed and deputies found someone to take care of the horse until the owner comes forward. And there are some images on the side of the sound system. It's built right into the back of the buggy. Well, that's it. It's a short one for the end of the show. I uh, hope you had a good time. Uh, I kind of did. Not feeling very well at all. Um, I hope this wasn't too much of a drag to listen to this week. Maybe next week I'll be in better form. Hope so. I hate being sick. I don't think anybody likes being sick. There's going to be a day when I record uh, while well, I think I'm getting sick. Because this is the second time I've done this. R- recorded the show while I'm starting to feel ill. And there's going to be a time where I, I just puke. And it's staying in the show. Why? Why not? Something new and different. I've never listened to a podcast where somebody puked. Uh, That's probably not true. So from here, I guess we say our goodbyes. You can check out the website at www.otheritemsofinterest.com. You can email us at otheritemsofinterestpod at gmail.com. You can check us out on Twitter at otheritems. And you can check us out on Instagram at Other Items Pod. Uh, follow, we'll follow back. Be happy to send us a message. We haven't gotten a message in a while. So, with that, I can confidently say cue the music. And welcome to the end of the show. This has been Other Items of Interest. I've been your host, Jack Sablocki. Uh, hope it wasn't too bad today. And it was kind of mediocre. But what are you going to do? We'll be back next week. Hopefully feeling better with a better show. Bye-bye.